Thank you, Prof Chikanova and Prof Prizer. Up next, Prof Ada Yonath joins us virtually and will talk about the fruits of curiosity. The Q&A session will be moderated by Prof Chu Wei Leong. Prof Yona, please. Good day. I would have liked to be here today with you, but since I cannot, at least uh, I sent my lecture and I would like to tell you about what is it. It's about the translation of the genetic code into its products, the proteins, and how one can stop it if one wants to stop the life of a pathogen by antibiotics. Antibiotics are fantastic, but there are problems with them. Uh, and the main problem is resistance, and we are trying now to fight against it, and that's the, about what the lecture talks. Thank you. I want to talk about next generation antibiotics, or at least what we suggest should be next generation uh, antibiotics. And for this, I also want to show my motivation, which was actually curiosity, like that of our hero, Mr. Einstein, that said that he, all what he had was curiosity and passion to it. When I became a young scientist, I thought the translation of the instructions embedded in the genetic code into proteins is one of the most interesting, in this interesting life process. Therefore, I focused on it. What do I mean? Let's first see what proteins do. And what I use here is some pictures from a children's book about proteins in human. But actually proteins perform nearly all the essential functions in every living cell, even in bacteria, in flowers, in trees, and in human. So here there are some proteins, a hair and skin, structural proteins, signaling proteins like insulin, transport proteins like hemoglobin, sensory proteins like vision, and enzymes that are taking apart the proteins that we eat to their components in order to make new proteins, those that we need. So what what we know about proteins, some of them perform almost all cellular functions, as you saw previously, even muscle motion, and some are responding to pressure, like heat or cold choke, sometimes heart events, and so on. Proteins are long chains made of amino acids. There are 20 types of amino acids. The fold of each protein, which is carefully designed for fulfilling its function, is determined by the sequence of the amino acids that are building it. So what I mean, what I want to tell, is in nature, structure means function. Look at this machine, very sophisticated machine that is called paperclip. It works only when the fold is correct, where the structure is correct. If it's, the, if it's being modified by fingers, without hitting, without calling, without, par, without cutting, without any, anything, just changing the structure or the fold, there is no function. And this is the way proteins work. So as I said earlier, there are 20 types of amino acids, and their sequence within the proteins, which enable its functionality, is dictated by the gene that codes for proteins. So proteins are made according to their genes, which are in the DNA. Actually, the DNA is a string of instructions written in a four-letter language, in which each three letters, or we call them also bases, are coding for a specific amino acid. These are called codons, these three, three letters, these triplets. So this is a, an, a typical enzyme. It's made of many atoms, many amino acids, each made of atoms. It has an a, a, um, active site. And if we look into the active site, this is here. And this is supported by the structure around it. I rotated it and I enlarged it. And you can see the active site now with the substrate. And you see that the substrate fills it exactly 
If it was too large, it won't fit. If it was too, fl too small, it was flip around. So it must fit this exact. So this must be exactly according to what nature does. This, in this case, what nature needs is this for this substrate. So how, how do the proteins, how do, are they made? Here there are five uh, amino acids, five com components. All of them have, it's, it's part of the 20, yeah? All of them have uh, the, same, the same backbone, and all of them have the backbone that can fit each other, and each of them has a different side chain that gives them the, the uh, biological or the chemical character, and some of the side chains can also be biological tools. They get together, they become more and more and more together, so, much, so long that I didn't even uh, draw the details. Then, then it, they become long protein, about each protein, each normal proteins are about between 200 to 500 amino acids, and it's worth nothing unless it is folded with an active site, as you could so see earlier in the real protein. So this was known when I started my work, but it was not known how it happens. This is what I wanted to find out, how this happens. So many other people wanted to do it. And they were more experienced and they had better labs and they failed. So there was a big, uh, there, there was a big skepticism about the possibility to understand it. There were even papers saying it cannot be done. Yet, I tried to, to, to do this. I will tell you afterwards why. I knew that we also can fail, but I knew that if we don't fail, if we, if we make it, we will have a big smiley. And this is what we have today. So the central dogma says the DNA that you can see here is where the bases are. It means the letters, the triplets that code for the proteins. The information is inside here. These are the bases. These are the letters within the double helical structure. And here it is not uh, available for, for reading. It's covered. It's hidden. So the first thing that happens, there is a translation, a transcription, sorry, to a very similar molecule that can exist as a single chain. So here the, the letters are exposed and can be used. They are available for using. And this can be translated to growing proteins by a particle within every cell that is called ribosomes. Actually, there are many ribosomes within every, every living cell. So they are universal. It means they function in a very similar way in all cells, regardless of the source. It can be bacteria, it can be flower, it can be cockroach, it can be human. They do the same thing the decoding and the production of the protein the same way. There is a huge number of ribosomes that function in every living cell. Even in bacteria, they can reach 100,000 when they work. And in some mammalian, mammalian cells can contain millions. For instance, the liver may have five to six million uh, ribosomes. In vivo, the ribosomes act continuously. They can form up to 40 peptide bonds in a second. They hardly make mistake. So I, as a very good and fast student, needed six hours for one bond. But they can do 40 in a second with a mistake rate of about one to a million. So now that we know how they work, we like to describe them as, as a factory that we call ribosomes that is made of two floors. In the top floor, the information is being decoded. The triplets are coming in. It means the whole messenger RNA comes in, and triplets, when a, good, when a triplet come here, it, it, and it, it's found what it is coding for. The amino acid that is cognate to it will come inside into the factory and be connected to the growing protein that goes out. This arrow had to be inside, but I, I don't know how to draw it. So I drew it outside, but it happens in the factory. Then this truck will become empty and join the other empty trucks. And as I told you, there are two floors. Here the decoding is being made, and here the, the making of the protein, the making of the bond, which is called peptide bond. So actually what you saw 
in the, in, in the factory is shown here now in molecular way. Ribosomes, all ribosomes are made of two subunits, small and large. Oh, these two subunits are independent in, in the cell. They, they live as small and large. They come together when ribosome has to work. And they are connected by contacts between them and by this, the truck, the tRNA molecule that, that brought the amino acids. So here it is, and it connects between the decoding center and the peptide bond formation center, which is called PTC. So this is what, what uh, we found after 20 years minus two weeks of work. And we made a little movie that is available in YouTube that you can see here. Here, messenger RNA comes to the small subunit that waits. There are factors in the cell that are coding for, for the, uh, sorry, that are telling the ribosomes that has to start to work. There are initiation factors. In bacteria, there are three of them. And what you see here is actually ribosome from bacteria. And the whole thing is monitored by them. So, yes, there are many, many more factors. You will see some in a minute. So messenger is reaching the small subunit that takes it. We made the movie, us, together with two students of the Art Academy in Jerusalem. And the messenger now will go into its path in the small subunits, the top floor of the factory. And it's monitored by initiation factor three. When this is okay, initiation factor two is bringing it the first, the first track, the tRNA molecule with the amino acid, this one. And now where everything is okay, the factors go out and the large subunit can come and associate with the small one by their surface and by making, and by making bridges. Now the ribosome is ready to work. We look at it from the solvent side. Up is the large subunit, below is the small one. And you can see elongation factors bringing it inside the tracks. The tracks are being decoded and peptide bond is being made. And you can see the ribosome helps. And it makes very fast, 40, in, in a, 41 in, 40 of them in a second. So you can see here how the decoding happens in the small subunit. And from the large subunit, we left only the tunnel through which the protein goes out. So this is how it is being protected when it's made. Now you can see the whole ribosome again. The tunnel is inside there in the large subunit. And the process continues until the protein is large enough. Here it is being grown and coming out. And when, it, when there is a stop codon, a codon that says stop, then instead, instead of tRNA come, comes a factor, recycling factor and release factor. These factors separate between the small and the large subunit. The protein can fold and come out and has to do what it has. And the tRNAs, the, the trucks, and the messenger and the ribosome are waiting for the next job. That's all. That's the whole story. So, sorry. So, uh, what we saw in the movie was rather fuzzy, but what actually happens is that we know the position of each and every atom in the ribosome, small subunit, which sediments as 30s and large subunit is 50s. You can see that the ribosome is made of many components. The main one is ribosomal RNA, another RNA molecule, and many ribosomal proteins in many colors here. And just to remind you, the small subunit is doing the decoding, and the large is peptide bond, is for peptide bond formation. Now let's look at these people. All of them are giants, either in music like Mozart, Chopin, Schubert, or a very intellectual writers. And what's common to all of them is they, are, they died very young. You, you can see their lifespan. The oldest is 47. Also what's common to all of them, they died before or at the middle of last century. What you cannot see in the picture, but I can tell you, is they all died from infectious diseases that people don't die now from them. So what happened in the middle of last century? In the middle of last century, antibiotics came into use. And they saved the lives of many, many people and, of course, extending life, lifespan. So because of the fundamental role played by ribosomes, many antibiotics target them. Almost half, over 40% of the clinically useful antibiotic, an antibiotics target protein biosynthesis, mostly 
by paralyzing the ribosome. What are the natural antibiotics? They are the weapons that bacteria from one type use in, to interfere with the life of other species of microorganisms when they have fights for space or for food or so, and so on. Question is, how do the tiny antibiotic paralyze the giant ribosome? So bacterial ribosome have a molecular weight of two and a half million Dalton and antibiotics less than a thousand. And the trick is that they target, they are bound to the active sites. So you see here the small subunit and the large subunit and the circles are showing where are families of antibiotics. It means the natural antibiotics that were uh, modified by companies. And you see all of them are bound to functional sites, either to the decoding or to the bonding or to the tunneling or to the hinging. These are the motions that are needed for continuing. So that's the, this is the trick and we want to show you a movie that was made based on the previous movie and it's already 13 years ago and as I told you, in YouTube and it shows that the tricks played by the antibiotics. So this is a small one, edain, that doesn't let the messenger bind. That's all. Second one that you will see is tetracycline. It also works at the small subunit. It doesn't let the second tRNA bind to the second position. So one is bound, but the second cannot. Second position is called the A site, for those that want to know. So it just, just uh, occupies it. Then I want to show two that work on the large subunit. First is erythromycin, which is one of the first that came into use in medicine right after penicillin. It sits in the tunnel. If you remember, the tunnel that protects the protein and doesn't let more than a very short protein to be made, and then it blocks. And the last one that you will see is disturbing the formation of the bond, very clever chemically maybe the most clever chemically. So here the bond is being made and it just sits in the bond. No bond, no more protein. That's the whole story. So, sorry. Eh. All ribosomal antibiotics bind to ribosomal functional sites. We just saw it. But these are highly conserved because all, all ribosomes work the same way. I already said it. And mandatory for clinical use is the distinction between the patient and the pathogen. So how does this happen? This happens by subtle differences. Even in highly conserved regions, there are subtle differences. And I want to show you one to explain. So if we look into it, we, we look into the whole large subunit. This is the entrance to the tunnel, and erythromycin blocks most of it. Enough not to let proteins go through it. So if we look at this position in the tunnel, like a perpendicular to its long axis, we see that there is a pocket, and the pocket is made just from ribosomal RNA, and all the members of the erythromycin family, which is called macrolides, are bound here. So some are bound excellently, some are bound very good, some are bound just good, but all of them block the tunnel. And all of them interact with one of the components of the tunnel that I uh, marked as a pink, and it's adenine A in position 2058, according to E. coli. So this is correct for all bacteria. All your bacteria have A in this position. Let me, see how, let me show you how it binds erythromycin. So this is this A, and this is erythromycin, and the affinity here, the chemical affinity, is very, very good. It means this is very cleverly designed by bacteria. Now please, ladies and men, gentlemen, pay attention to this point, and you will see the difference between bacteria and us. This is all bacteria and us. But when there is a G here, us, there is repulsion. This is too close here, the distance, and there is no binding. That's all between bacteria and us, between bacteria and any, any higher organism. Second question that I want to discuss, second point, is resistance. Resistance to antibiotics is one of the most severe problems in modern medicine. And let's talk about it. First of all, how it is being acquired. So I will show you one of the methods. Selectivity was shown here, between this and this. 
and the bacteria can just change themselves to G. And they are now they are resistance. Actually, resistance to antibiotics is a basic process for the survival of many microorganisms, regardless of their exposure to modern clinical treatment. And this is a, a, a very important fi finding. And this is one of the most severe problems, as I said before. The World Health Organization said we are reaching post-antibiotic era. It means the time that antibiotics will not be useful anymore. And even the World Bank estimated that up to 3.8, almost 4% of the global economy will be lost by 2050 because of resistance to antibiotics. Can we combat antibiotics fully? In my, in my opinion, not. Because bacteria want to live. Maybe want is a, a street word for it, but this is what happens. And they are cleverer than us in terms of survival. But we can do some things. So our uh, lab decided, we decided in our lab to help it because companies are hardly interested now in antibiotics. Most of the big companies are not interested at all. So until recently, all the known structures were of models for pathogens, not real pathogens. And this explained the common modes of antibiotic action, as I showed previously. But they do not explain special specificity of pathogens. And this is what we wanted to see. What's the difference between non-pathogenic and pathogenic? So we crystallized the large ribosomal subunit from a pathogen, actually a multi-resistant pathogen called Staph aureus. You can see here the crystals. And we got the structure. I won't show the whole structure. I will just show some lessons we studied by comparing it to non-pathogenic. So first of all, it's possible to increase antibiotic activity. More potent antibiotic can be made. We collaborated with a company called Nabriva, a small company in Vienna, and they made 16-fold stronger antibiotic. Lesson number two and three I skip. Lesson number four is beyond my expectation. Novel antibiotic binding sites. I didn't expect it. It's a very, very nice surprise, and in my opinion, also very powerful. So if we look here in the structure of the large subunit in gray, this is the skeleton in two, two views, this little bluish, this little uh, cyan, show where there are additions on the, on the skeleton of the large subunit. You can see some on this side and some on that side. And maybe you can see even better here from all sides. We, we draw, draw here only those that are on the surface and those that exist only in staph aureus, not in the pathogen models. So we, dis we suggest to use them as new, new positions for potential binding site, antibiotics potential binding site. And I want to show a, an example here. This is part of the ribosome. There are here st two structures, one of the model and one of the pathogen. Here they are indistinguishable, but here there is a little addition. This is what you saw in this in this uh, um, view. And we suggest that this can be potential binding sites because it's only in the pathogenic and it is, we found that it is also important for protein biosynthesis. So actually in a model system, we identify 25 new potential binding sites, unique, and 16 of them where they were blocked uh, chemically, they inhibit protein biosynthesis. And because these sites are not involved in the primary ribosome activity, namely in the decoding and peptide bond formation, no pathogen contains genes for their modification. It means the bacteria did not understand now, although they are clever, did not understand now that they are important. So for now, they can be exploited for the design of specific advanced degradable antibiotics, hence environmental friendly. So I didn't talk about, I talked a little about specificity, I'll talk about it a little bit more, and about degradability, it means environmental concerns. So first, specificity. I hope that you all know about the microbiome. The microbiome is where trillions of bacteria reside in our body. They are called the good bacteria. 
They are usually in semi-exposed organs like guts, ears, lung, and skin, and they are mainly harm and harmless. But they are susceptible to antibiotics. And so if antibiotics can penetrate into where they are, they can, they can uh, kill them too, and then people can catch other diseases. Therefore, we suggest to exploit these sites and design those that will not dis disturb the uh, microbiome, the good. Also, they are, can be degradable. What do I mean in degradable? This is the uh, environmental and ecology consideration. This is based on the fact that most of the ribosomal antibiotics that are used today are extensions of small organic inside the cores that are not digestible, and when they go out from the body with the rest, with the sewage, they are not degradable. And therefore, they can penetrate into the water. They are too small to be used, to be found by most of the used um, facilities for purification. And then they go into the water. They can penetrate into the irrigation water, and they come back to us. So this is why we, when we could, we, when we made, when we design our antibiotics, we want to make them degradable, biodegradable. So now I want a few words, how did we start? Because uh, I thought that this is, it has some, some lessons that we can learn from it. First of all, why did we use X-ray crystallography? Because human can see, I think maybe uh, insects. With, with normal microscopes, cells, bacteria, viruses, but not atomic, not atomic uh, detail. For this, we need crystallography. For this, for crystallography, we need crystals. They diffract. We see the diffraction here. They diffract according to the Fourier power transform, and if we collect the whole three-dimensional, whole uh, space around the crystal, we can get enough information to build back the structure. So here you can see X-ray coming. There is here a crystal. We collect the data with computers and with knowing how to do it. This little thing is the crystallographer. It means life, something like me. And then we get the structure. So we can get structures of uh, many types of molecules. But we need crystals. Let's define what crystals are. So this is sodium chloride. It's only two atoms, sodium and chloride. And it likes to make a three-dimensional periodic system, even in nature, spontaneously. So you can see full periodicity in three dimensions of chlorine and sodium in between. This is a natural crystal. This is a crystal of, crystal of a protein that was first crystallized in Oxford in the 60s, but a six years greater, about 12 years old girl, could repeat it. So proteins can be crystallized by this, this very complicated, now we know very complicated uh, structure that you know. But even before the structure was known, there was a big question mark. Actually, this question mark said no. And the people that try to crystallize it, they explain it uh, by all types of high degree of internal mobility, flexibility, structural heterogeneity, chemical complexity, all correct. But they paid attention less to a very important a property of ribosomes that they have marked tendency to, to deteriorate. Even when we prepared it, they deteriorate and we get less than half of the expected activity. And I was much more uh, um, open to this problem. So I thought, first of all, we have to find ways that the ribosomes won't de be deteriorated when we made them. Okay, I thought about it, but I didn't know what to do until I read the a paper about how do, is the metabolism of the sleeping bears in the North Pole. The North Pole, the sleeping are going to, the bears are going to sleep for the winter, and a delegation went to see what happened inside them. So they found out that in every cell, inside the uh, membrane of each cell, the ribosomes are fully organized periodically, monolayers, not real crystals, but monolayers of organization, and this shows that ribosomes can be orderly packed. Every bear, every cell. 
So then I thought, why is it? Why did nature provide this mechanism? And in my opinion, this is the way to maintain a pool of active ribosomes for the end of the winter when the bears would like to do other things and they need, they need proteins to do them. So the, uh, my conclusion was that stress induces periodic packing of ribosomal particles. So I thought, let's look at stress at, at, at bacteria that go at, grow under stress, stressful conditions. I didn't want to work on the bears, on the ribosomes of the bears. First, I didn't want to kill more bears, and more important, because the ribosomes from, from bacteria can be useful for medicine, whereas those of bears not. So the, the solution was to use ribosomes from bacteria that grow under stress, like in the Dead Sea, in hot springs, or in waste of nuclear facilities. I just want to show you the Dead Sea. It's the lowest point in the world. It's in Israel. You see, from top, no animal, no tree, no nothing, no life. You can see from closer, these are all structures of salt that came out by evaporation. No animal, no, no, no plant. But there are two types of bacteria, and I want to show you the colonies of one of them. Hello, Arcula maris morti here. You can see it here too. And I knew about this bacteria, and we used its ribosomes. Also, we use ribosomes of Dinococcus radiodurans, which is a bacteria that can grow under super extreme conditions, very hot, very cold, uh, environment, dust, no food, even under irradiation. And we got beautiful crystals. Look how nice. So we got actually 25 types of them. I show here only six, those that were useful for crystallography. And I want to show you, six years after we started, we went to measure them. We took crystals to measure in this accelerator, which is in Grenoble. In Israel is a, a member of it. Actually, we used another one, but it's such a beautiful picture, I decided to use this. From top, it looks like that. Look how wonderful. From getting close, you, you see how it works. So here there, is a, there are particles that be an accelerator, accelerator, then they run around in this ring. And in the tangential, we have stations. Here there is a station uh, that Frank is measuring on ribosomes. So each station has its own properties. Some are useful for ribosomes. So in 1986, six years after we started, we got the first diffraction. Look how beautiful. Beautiful spots all the way to the end from the last subunit of Halo Arcula in time equal zero. We were really very happy, but not for long. Second picture was already deteriorated, damaged. It means the, right, the uh, X-rays damaged the crystals. We repeated it 100 times, and we didn't get anything better. And we felt like we started from here, and we saw only this, only this mountain. We call it the average, the Everest, sorry. And we climbed it and climbed it and climbed it. Took six years until we got to the summit. And what did we see then? That a real, really big, much bigger Everest, much taller Everest behind that we will have to get there in order to measure. Much, much more difficult than until then. So this was the time I thought maybe we should stop this uh, this project, but instead I thought about why does it happen? All, all uh, living tissues suffer from x-rays, but this is much too much. So the, I explained it by the crystals being weak or very soft, and the damage occurs in two steps. The primary is local disruption of the bond, and then when the bonds are being cut by the x-ray, the two parts of the bond are unhappy going around and break and break more, bo more bonds in order to satisfy themselves, either to give an electron or to take an electron. And we thought that maybe the way to stop it was to cool the crystal so cold that there will not be energy for the running around. And this worked, although everybody didn't think so. Even I, look, this is the experiment done at Stanford. Look at my, fa my face. Even I didn't believe in, in, this, in our own experiment, but it worked beautifully. Have a look. And 20 years later, look how happy I am. Now it works. And this is, this is the machine that cools. And this is 
the, the machine that measures the X-rays. This is in Grenoble. Actually, not only for us, it worked for the whole world. We introduced it here in the, at the end of 86. Within the beginning of 87, 90% of the world used it, and now everybody. So what you see here is the number of structures that are known now and have been deposited in the protein data bank, and this is the year. And have a look, this is only till 2011. 47,000 uh, structures, all of them done, or 99% of them done in our cryo uh, uh, method. And all of them are of very important materials for medicine or for making new materials. Actually, now it's 2.17, and there are 80,000 new structures that could be, couldn't be done otherwise. So well, how about future? We go back to the lecture, and what I want to tell you, we plan to identify the specific structural features which are unique for each pathogenic bacteria. What I showed you about Staphorus, we want to do for all. Once we identify such features, we will design novel antibiotics for them. In these studies, in the novel antibiotics, we shall use cryo-electron microscopy, which provides high-resolution structures with no need of crystals. All what I told you until now about crystals, we will not need them in the, in the, in the future taking advantage of the current revolution in biostructure research. This is our program, and I hope that you support us. So before I finish, I want to thank the Weizmann Institute that let me work. Here is the president that made the decision, Michael Sella, he was a biologist. Although I was called the dreamer of the world, he still supported me. And uh, when he, was, he finished his term, he was replaced by Chaim Harari, who is a physicist, and he also supported me. They were, uh, they were uh, encouraged by the scientific advisory committee, among what I want to, about whom I want to highlight Alex Rich, who tried to crystallize ribosomes with no success for 10 years, and he was still very supportive. Actually, the whole work started with a very strong collaboration with Max Planck in Berlin, with Dr. Wittmann, that really, he really wanted to see the structure of the ribosomes. And he helped in establishing a group for us in Hamburg near the synchrotron there. He died 10 years before the structures came, unfortunately. And then he was replaced by Franceschi and then by Fuccini. So I want to thank my research group for, in the two places for their devotion and determination in good and in bad times for many years. Here, this is the group in Hamburg. It was terminated in 2004. It always had angels. The, the technical assistants say that otherwise they cannot work if they're not angels. Ribosomes are too complicated. And the group came to the Dead Sea to look for new bacteria. Well, they had good time. The group in Israel is still working. Here you can see people that came and, and went through the last three years. Some of them are still with us. <coughs> I want to highlight Dr. Anad Bashan, who is the senior scientist that runs the show all the time when I'm uh, doing other things, and I want to, I cannot sh show you one by one, but I want to let you pay attention to Tamar. Tamar came 16 years ago for 10 weeks. She's still around. Uh, at the day that I took a picture, she, she had birthday, so she, cooked, uh, she baked a, a cake. You want to see the cake? Here is the cake. And it shows that in my group, ribosomes are considered sweet. I also want to thank my family. I cannot show you all of them. Uh, my mother, my sister, and so on, You're just my, my daughter, who is a doctor, a medical doctor, and her daughter. This is the girl that crystallized the, the ribosome when she was 12. And they were also supportive all the time, even when I wasn't there. My granddaughter actually gave me a speech and then a prize. I will show you the prize in a, morning, in a, in a minute. As in the speech, she said, as you know, she is a very busy scientist but she always finds time for me. And this is the prize that she gave me. No, 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 this one. This is the medal, uh, Nobel medal. Her prize is the grandma of the year is Ada Yonat, at least as important. And when I asked her, what is the year? Every prize has a year. She said, you have to reprove yourself every year. I'll take it off the wall if you fail. Still on the wall, you see? So ribosomes became popular in a carnival. Here is me. 
and she, his wife, his ribosome, look, protein comes out of him. Also younger, people, younger children became ribosomes. And this is what happened to me by one of the best artists and writers in Israel, Michel Kishka. And if you have a look very carefully, this is the large subunit, and this is the small one, and it's symmetrical. And he thinks that the best place for antibiotics is here and here. Thank you. Okay, I hope that you liked it, and I hope that something will come out of it, at least mentally, intellectually. And I, as I said, I would have liked to be here with you today, but since I cannot, good day to all of you. Well, I, I believe she's actually live, right? Connected? We have time for one question. Uh, from online. Um, very great talk. Could you tell us some strategies to fight pathogens that might not use uh, small molecule antibiotics and hence try to avoid the development of resistance? Offline? Yeah, we'll wait. Do we have any burning questions from the audience while we wait? We, we, we only have a short amount of time. Maybe you ask us and we'll see whether, which one is better. You want to do that? <laughs> you, you, yeah, yeah, you want to ask a question? We're waiting for her to come online. Yeah, yeah, I will take the, the subjective I, position. Yeah. Uh, I actually have two questions here. No, 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 no just a quick one. Quick one, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm not trying to put you in a spot, right? Sure. Hi. Uh, yeah, my question is that uh, to combat uh, um, antibiotic resistance, one of the strategies is using um, using combination therapy. Uh, so my question is that from the mechanistic point of view, what are the best uh, combinations for the ribosome targeting antibodies? And my second quick question, is, no, sorry. Hi, Prof. Great talk. Uh, do you manage to catch the, the previous question? I think that she asked how to, how to treat people. I think, I think uh, we could summarize. We have two questions here. Um, perhaps I'll summarize. Could you share with us some, some strategies of fighting pathogens that uh, might not involve small molecule antibiotics and hence could it uh, try to bypass antibiotics resistance? So actually, this is what we are doing now. But now is a very long time. It's, it's, uh, it doesn't really work fast. We have, we have to be very careful and go step by step. But what we are trying is to find specific peripheral features on the outside of the ribosome for each pathogen alone and find a way to attack or to bind to these features. And so far we have done it for, uh, at least for Staph Arus, and uh, we are working on tuberculosis also, but this will be bacteria specific. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure to, if to call it antibiotics, but at least antibacteria. I believe we might not have further time for further questions, but thank you so much for sharing your insights uh, to the young scientists here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening.